section 6 of the Indian Evidence Act of 1872 speaks about an important principle that is res geste. What is this principle of res geste? What does it mean? Section 6 says that facts forming part of the same transaction are relevant. So how do we come to a conclusion that these facts are relevant? Suppose those facts are not in issue but still they are so connected with the fact in issue that they, uh, they are seen to form part of the same transaction. So such facts which are in issue or may not be in issue, they are connected with some fact in issue so that they form part of the same transaction which is before the court, which is before the consideration of the court. Such facts are relevant whether they occur at the same time and place or at different times and different places. This is the principle of registry. Now suppose, uh, let us look into an uh, illustration. A is accused of the murder of B by beating him. So that is the incident. Now in that case, whatever was said by A or done by A or B or whatever was said or done by the bystanders at the time of the beating or shortly before that beating or shortly after that beating, all these things, all these facts form part of the same transaction and therefore all those things which were said or done, they are relevant and they are relevant facts according to section 6. In another illustration we can say, suppose A is accused of waging war against the government of India by taking part in an armed insurrection. What has happened in different places? For example, in some places, property is destroyed, troops are attacked, jails are broken open. To look at these incidents or these events are shown as something different. But when we see that they have a thread of connection between them, all the occurrence of these facts are relevant because they form part of the same general transaction. Though A particularly may not have been present in all these events, but still all those events are relevant. Now for example, A sues B for a libel. This libel is contained in a letter which was uh, sent to him. It is forming a part of the correspondence between A and B. Now, before that correspondence was done or before that letter was sent to him, there were several letters between these parties. And maybe that some letters contained the libel, some letters did not contain the libel. But that was relating to the subject out of which the libel arose. Then in such cases, all those letters they form part of the correspondence in which that libel is contained and therefore they are relevant facts and they can be put before the court. So this is the facts which are forming part of the same transaction. We can go to another illustration where some goods were ordered from B and they were to be delivered to A. The question was whether they are delivered or not. Now before they reach A, there were several other places where they, these goods have to uh, travel. So the goods were delivered to several intermediate persons successively. Every delivery, wherever it goes to the different, actually that delivery is not a part of a uh, issue before the court. But still, each delivery is a relevant fact because it parts, all these parts are form of a, uh, the connection between the transaction, which is the delivery. So looking at these illustrations, we can see what is the importance of a doctrine of registry. Res geste, which means in Latin, things done. When we come to the English meaning, things done are said in the course of a transaction. That means all those facts which are surrounding the happening of a particular thing or an event or a transaction, all those facts are called as its res geste. Though in this section, it, not, it does not say that uh, res geste or the phrase res geste is relevant. It doesn't speak of that phrase at all. It only says facts forming part of the same transaction. But we relate it to the English doctrine of res geste. Now what is a transaction? A transaction is a group of facts so connected together so that those facts together when we consider they can be referred to by a single name. For example, when we say that a crime is committed. Now that crime is a transaction. When we say that a contract has been entered to, the contract is a transaction. When we say that a wrong has been committed, a tort has been committed, that wrong is a transaction. Or suppose we say that there is any subject of inquiry which is in front of the court. 
then that subject of inquiry is this transaction. So, in this transaction, whatever the group of facts are there, they are connected together, they have to be proved so that we can prove that particular issue before the court. Now, that subject of inquiry or the transaction is an issue. Those facts may be an issue or may not be an issue. For example, we can go to one important case that is uh, Ratton versus Queen to understand this particular transaction and what is the connection. A person was prosecuted for the murder of his wife and his um, defense was that the shot had just went off and he did not intentionally kill or if there was no intention to kill, it was an accident. So, whether it was an accident or whether the act was intentional was the question. That is the issue before the court. Now, the facts which were brought before the court was that at the time of uh, uh, the person, the deceased, when she was dying, she calls up the police and she says, please get me the police and gives her address. The address was noted down. Before the police were, uh, were uh, connected, she drops down the receiver and she falls dead. When the police go to the place where she is uh, there, they find that she is already dead. Now, the question is, those words which were spoken by her just before her death, that is, please get me the police. When she says that, whether it shows whether the act is intentional or not and whether it is part of the same transaction is a question. If they are part of the same transaction, then they are relevant. Otherwise, they are not relevant. Now, what is this transaction? The transaction is that particular incident, incident when she dies. So, when we say that uh, at that time she calls the police, it means that she had an idea that it is a uh, it is a attempt to murder her by her husband or that the act was intentional. So, to show that, that it was intentional, the person has to uh, give these facts because they, par they form part of the same incident at that time. That means, once those words are taken in evidence, it can be seen that the person knew that it is intentional and therefore, it is a part of the same transaction and these uh, facts have to be taken to prove that it was not uh, accidental because if it was an accident, she would have not called the police. She would know that it is an accident and therefore, when she knew that he was going to kill her, she calls the police and says that please get me the police. So, this was a very important case where the importance of this doctrine was discussed. Now, there are sometimes repeated acts and uh, there are different acts and in the end something happens or some transaction happens which is in front of the court. In O'Leary versus the regime, uh, a person was under the influence of beer and wine and he went to different places and he committed different acts of violence. Now, whether they were part of the same transaction, that means whether they were part of the killing which happened at the end, that is uh, he was arrested for homicide and whether it was a connected course of conduct. Here, the court said that this is a particular case where all the different acts of violence were done, they are all connected to that same mental state of that person and therefore, it forms the connected uh, fact or the fact or the same transaction which is the homicide. So, it was uh, held to be admissible. Now, whether acts or omissions or particular acts can be taken as res geste. Now, the thing is, the nature of the transaction itself, it shows what are its parts, it indicates its parts, whether it is an act or whether it is an omission and whether it has to be taken. In one important case, Mann versus Rizler, the contract was made with a person and the question was whether the contract was made in his personal capacity or whether he has entered into the contract as an agent of another person. Because if he enters in his personal capacity, it becomes he becomes liable because uh, if he is an agent, then the principal becomes liable and there is no liability upon that person. Now, in this case, the person who was uh, uh, contracting, he had made, written a letter to his broker and asked his uh, the broker to make certain inquiries about that person so that he will enter into a contract with that person. Now, the thing is, if a person makes personal inquiries and asks about these things, it shows, it points out that uh, he is going to enter into a uh, contract in his personal capacity because he is interested in that contract. So, in this case, the 
uh, the thing that he wrote a letter to his broker and that letter was held as admissible as it is a part of the same transaction that is the contract. So this is act or omission which shows that it is part of the same transaction. Whether statements can be taken as rest stay or whether they can be taken as part of the same transaction. Now the question is sometimes a person makes a statement. After that something happens or at the time of that incident itself he says something. For example, a person is dying. She shouts help, help or she says please come to me or please see he is doing these things to me. So whether those statements can be taken as part of the same thing which is an issue before the court that is the transaction or the crime. Now the principle is that the statement should have been made either soon after that incident or it should be made before, just before that incident or it should be made along with the incident. So that there should not be any time for that person to fabricate some story or to concoct a false story. So this is indicated in three cases. The first case we can discuss is R versus Beddingfield in which the statement was held not to be a part of this registry. Here in this case what has happened is a lady comes rushing out of her room with her throat cut and she says, Oh aunt, see what Beddingfield has done to me and she falls down and that is a case of murder which has been discussed before the court. Now in this case the court says that when she comes rushing out of the room, there is a time between the actual committing of the murder or her throat being cut and her coming out of the room and then uttering that statement. So the court says that this cannot be taken as a day because it is not part of the same transaction. And then there was an argument that it could be taken as a dying declaration. But the court said that she did not have an idea or a, any such a, uh, uh, reason to believe that she was going to die. Therefore, it could not be taken as a dying declaration also. According to English law, there is a condition that the person should know that he is dying, then only his statement will be taken as a dying declaration. So, neither it was relevant as a registry because they said that there is a time bar, there is a time lag between the event and the statement and therefore it cannot be taken. Of course, this case has been criticized and the Privy Council later on has uh, said that this is uh, uh, a case which could not be cited for a uh, purpose of uh, uh, following or for a, a precedent, but there could be variations. But in some cases, this has been taken, this case has been taken as a uh, precedent also. Let us come to the second case, R versus Foster. A person came to know that there is an accident and then he heard somebody groaning there. He goes to that place and he sees a person was hit by a car. The car went by a very uh, rapid rate and it hit him. This person had seen the car passing by rapidly, but he did not see the actual accident. But when he goes up to that person and uh, the person who is dying, he says that uh, this was the car and he uh, gives uh, a description of the car and after that he dies. Now, whether that particular statement could be admitted as part of the same transaction was the question. In this case, the court has held that it could be taken as part of the same transaction as a principle of arrest yesterday and though that person had, the witness had seen only the speeding vehicle, still the nature of the accident was described by the person who was injured and therefore it is a, it is part of arrest yesterday. When we see that, we see that only a person who has heard something from somebody else also could produce that statement as a part of a uh, same transaction and that could be admitted. There is another case, Venkatation versus State, when the question of the time, the time lag between the event and the particular person's statement was considered. In this case, there was an assault upon the deceased and after that he dies and then uh, uh, the person who has committed, that is the prisoner who was arrested for the uh, crime, he after about an half an hour, he goes to his brother and he says that I have done this. So he repeats that as a statement to his brother. Now that was brought before the court as part of registry or part of the same transaction. Now whether that thing which has been stated to his brother could be taken as relevant as a part of a registry that is under section 6 of the act. Here the court said that it is admissible because half an hour gap after committing a crime, if he comes and tells his uh, brother, 
it cannot be considered to be a long gap or long time which has elapsed between the two. But suppose there would be a long gap and the person later on uh, recollects, later on says to somebody that this has been happened. Later on, maybe about uh, one month later or one week later or one day later, it depends upon the circumstances what is the principle to be followed. So here when we see all these things, uh, we can uh, just note down the principles which are laid down from the first case itself that is Rattan versus Regina. The test here should not be just whether the making of the statement was uh, in some uh, sense part of the event or transaction, but in addition, the statements which were made after the event, the judge should satisfy himself that that statement which was made by a person was so spontaneous that it could not be concocted or there was no opportunity for him to concoct or to make some false uh, story relating to that particular thing. So, that has to be uh, looked into by the judge. Thirdly, if the judge considers the statement to be a narrative of some prior event, that is, uh, suppose there is some event which has happened and the speaker who was uh, uh, telling the story, he could just be able to construct his account, then the judge should not take it as a registry and he should exclude it. That is the same thing which has been mentioned in R versus Bedingfield also where the court said that there was a time gap and therefore the judge should not take that statement, it is inadmissible. So, sometimes we feel that in such cases, these principles which are laid down, they also overlap with some other sections of this act or some other provisions under this act. So, what is the requirement or what is the necessity of uh, considering facts which may be remote actually or which may be having a time gap and uh, taking it as an evidence? What is the importance of this doctrine? Sometimes it is said that this is hearsay evidence because as we have just seen, a person goes to a victim of an accident and later on the victim tells him about something, hearing from him he brings that fact before the court. So this is something which is hearsay. So normally the principle is that hearsay evidence cannot be allowed to be given by a person who is not a direct witness to that particular transaction. But this doctrine of rest estate has been taken as an exception to the principle of hearsay. On what grounds? Because sometimes there is a necessity to take certain facts. They, without these facts, we cannot uh, look into that transaction individually or uh, we cannot isolate that transaction from those facts. In such cases, the judge has to look into these facts and uh, consider as an exception to the principle of hearsay. Now, as we said, there are a lot of criticisms uh, to this doctrine, uh, especially Professor Vigno says that this rule of uh, admitting facts which are part of the same transaction, though they are remote or though they are hearsay, this is not only use, useless, but it is also harmful. Why is it useless? Because he says that every part of this uh, fact or this transaction or every part of these facts which are stated before the court, they are covered by some other rule. For example, uh, as we said just now, when he commits acts in the influence of uh, wine or beer, so it uh, shows his state of mind or health. That is also taken under some other provisions of this act. So, it uh, also is covered under some other rule, then what is the use of this registry or a separate rule under section 6 to be considered? Therefore, he says it is an useless rule. Why is it harmful? He says that it causes confusion about the limitation of the other rules. When we discuss about uh, uh, some other rules uh, relating to section 7 or section 8 or section 32 for that matter, uh, there are specific provisions or specific uh, conditions which we follow. Here when we say rest state, it is very difficult to pinpoint that uh, how it is part of the same transaction. It has to be looked into looking into the circumstances of the case. So, it causes confusion about the limitation of other rules. This is the criticism which is made. But nevertheless, as a summary, we could say that the precise limits of rest just are hard to define because facts differ so greatly. We cannot fix any principle, very fixed principle that this should be taken and this should not be taken or which is part of a uh, same transaction or not. However, Suppose such facts are seen to form part of the same transaction, which is the subject of inquiry, then it uh, follows that such facts should not be excluded from evidence and it should be taken and it should be admitted to prove that transaction before the court. I hope you have learned something from this video. If you have liked it, please share it with anyone who you think would be interested. Please leave your comments and I would be happy to reply to them. 
Do subscribe to get more information on everyday law and legal studies. Thank you.